What is up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC 273. We have Alexander Volkanovsky going against the Korean Zombie. Boom. I need all the wins. Yeah. Harder than all that is. You better move, you might get knocked out. Knocked out. You better move, you might get knocked out. Knocked out. You better move, you might get knocked out. And we are back for another full card breakdown and prediction video after a week off, and we get rewarded with a phenomenal card uh, from top to bottom, really, especially the three fights up top. We have Kamzat Chemayev, Gilbert Burns. We have the two title fights, Aljamain Sterling, Piotr Jan, the rematch, and then Alexander Volkanovsky, Korean Zombie, the main event. I like this card. I'm glad we have MMA back. I hate weeks off, uh, but we're right back at it, right back into it here. So um, before we get started, I do have some plugs here, some things to talk about. Um, if you guys have not already, sign up on DFSbythenumbers.com. Lots of great things going on over there. The most popular option is the $10 betting tier. Um, with that, you get access to my UFC stat model. First notice on all bets, my betting article that drops on Friday, my betting breakdown video, my Hail Mary parlay, my access to Discord, uh, full card breakdown and best bet article. A lot of people seem to really like that. That does drop on Wednesday. Basically, I break down the whole card in article form, and then I get my prediction, and then I get my best bet on each and every fight. So that best bet article, I think, adds a ton of value to the package that I've been doing the last several years. So, um, yeah, check that out. $10 a month. Also, some DFS on there as well. Um, DFS by the numbers.com. It's been a great year so far, a profitable January. February, March, three months down, nine months to go. Hopefully, keep it rolling, and hopefully, we start it rolling with uh, this car right here. I do already have two bets. I did place them last week. I wanted to get in early on them. I thought those lines would move, and they have a little bit, um, and I think they're going to continue to move, and there's some other spots that I'm looking at, just waiting for some props to get out at this point. Um, other than that, uh, doing the significant strike contest, as always, like we do on pay-per-views, um, to enter that contest first leave a like second subscribe to the channel if you are not already and then third comment down how many significant strikes you think that alexander volkanovsky and the korean zombie are going to combine for whoever does get closest or gets it on the dot 25 dollars the first if there is a tie the tiebreaker is whoever commented first um so if you win you know paypal cash up all that good stuff 25 dollars the first there and then other than that uh live stream friday seven o'clock p.m eastern time after the weigh-ins, and then live stream Saturday one hour prior to the prelims uh, with me, Uncle Wheezy, Narco Cop, and Eric Betts Fights, where we do best bet, where we give our best bet on each and every fight on the card. So make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss out on all the content that's going to be coming out throughout the week for uh, UFC 273 and beyond. So with all that out of the way, I say we get right into it. Let's start with the very first fight of the night. We have Julio Arce going against the newcomer, Daniel Santos. So uh, Julio Arce, he is 32 years old, 5'7", with a 70-inch reach, 17-5, and five, and 2-3 and three in his last five fights. Daniel Santos, 27 years old, 5'7", not sure on the reach there, but he is 10-1 and 4-1 and and in his last five fights. So as always, we're going to take a look at these odds, and we see that Julio Arce opened up minus 160, he's currently minus 187, and Daniel Santos opened up plus 140, and he is currently plus 162, and yeah, this is kind of a tricky fight, especially for, for betting, but even like picking the fight, because we know a lot about Julio Arce, he's been in the UFC for some time now, it's just, yeah, we don't know a ton about Daniel Santos, and of course, I was able to go back and watch a good amount of fights, and you know, honestly, I was very impressed with Santos, I mean, this guy's very dangerous, he's very explosive, and he's very fun to watch, I see why the UFC signed him, like this guy does a ton of spinning attacks, and I've seen him hurt guys with a spinning kick to the body like two or three different times, so... Um, he's fun to watch, and I think it's going to be a very fun fight, and I think he's going to have fun fights going forward. But the thing with Santos is this guy has not fought in two years, which, you know, that could be a, a good thing because um, he is 27 years old. Last time he fought, he was 25. He's training at a good gym, same gym as uh, Charles Oliveira. So maybe he has made improvements over two years, or, you know, it could be a bad thing, whereas, you know, the – the inactivity, you don't like to see that. You'd like to see guys being more active. But yeah, this guy's not fought in two years and three months. Like, it's been a while. And then it's kind of a tough ask for him to come in, you know, off a two year, three month layoff, make his UFC debut against a guy like Arce, who is not you know, only fought good guys, but he's beat good guys. He's beat guys like, like Dan Ige. He's, you know, finished guys like Andre Yule. Um, he's a, he's a very good fighter. I like his striking. I like his volume. I like his striking defense, uh, 67% striking defense. Um, you know, he's, his last loss to Song Yudong, no shame in that. I think Song Yudong's a beast, but again, wins over Julian Arosa, Daniel Tamar, Dan Ige, you know, he has good wins, good guys. So, 
Um, I don't think that Santos has like fought complete bums or anything like that, but this is going to be a step up in competition. I think I gotta go with Arce to win this fight. I'm gonna pick it win by decision, but and I don't know if if Santos comes in here after a two year layoff and has made like massive improvements, it would not shock me. But you know, Julio Arce is a guy that has been fighting good competition. He's been looking good. He's been beating uh, you know good guys, and he's been more active. So I gotta go Arce here. I'm gonna take Arce to win by decision, but I'm really excited to see the debut of Daniel Santos, and I will not be betting this fight. All right, next we have Pierre Rodriguez, another fighter making her UFC debut. Uh, Rodriguez off the contender series going against Kay Hansen. We have Rodriguez, who is 29 years old, 5'3", with a 63.5-inch reach, 7-0. Obviously, 5-0 in her last five fights. Kay Hansen, 22 years old, 5'2", with a 63-inch reach, 7-5, and 3-2 and and in her last five fights. Let's take a look at those odds. And we see that Rodriguez open at minus 110. She's currently minus 112. Kay Hansen open at minus 110. She's currently minus 108. So a very closely lined fight for a very close fight, in my opinion. So, you know, what I looked for in Rodriguez was going to be her takedown defense. I think takedown defense is going to be key for her here because we know that her striking is very good. And you can see that her striking is very good. Like, she has a ton of power. I think she's finished five of her seven fights by knockout. She hits very, very hard for the division. Um, so the striking's there, but how is her takedown defense? I went and watched some fights of her. Um, I watched like earlier fights, like 2016, 2017, and her takedown defense did not look great. But you know, as you go on and as she you know starts improving, her takedown defense starts to look very good. And you know, when she is taken down, she actually does a really good job at you know working her way back up to her feet. And you do like to see that a lot. Uh, she looks very strong. She looks very physical. Um, so I think that Kay Hansen is probably going to struggle to get this fight down to the mat. On the feet, it's going to be Pereira Rodriguez for me really all day. I don't think Kay Hansen is going to offer many issues at all on the feet, but you know we know what Kay Hansen wants to do, and that is get the fight down to the mat. She was not able to have success with it in her last fight against Jasmine Jazdevicious, who, you know, by the way, that fight was up a weight class at 125 pounds. Kay Hansen is a 115er and a very small 115-pound fighter as well. She's only 5'2 with a 63-inch reach. Uh, she was fighting up a weight class against Jasmine Jazdevicious, who has a 5'7 reach, or a, who has a 68-inch reach, and she is 5'7. So she really did struggle with the much bigger Jasmine Jazdevicious. She did take a round off, or she won that third round, but... You take a look at the Corey McKenna fight. I did think Hanson won that fight. She was able to get Corey McKenna down twice. And then also the Jinyu Frey, Jin Frey fight, uh, Kay Hanson was able to get Fry down uh, twice as well. Jinyu Frey typically has very good takedown defense on paper, 90%. So, you know, I think Prayer Rodriguez, if she gets taken down, I think she will work her way back up. I think Kay Hanson's going to have a hard time getting down Rodriguez, first of all, and then keeping down Rodriguez. I think this fight primarily plays out on the feet. Um, so, so for that reason, I'm going to slightly edge the Rodriguez side. But yeah, if Kay Hansen can get Rodriguez down to the mat, like Kay Hansen is a 10th planet brown belt in BJJ, I think she will be a better grappler. It's just, you know, I don't see her having much success in terms of taking down Rodriguez and holding her down. But regardless, like this is a very, very close fight. I get why the line has kind of opened and flipped and, you know, flipped in so many different ways. Like, at first, it was, I think, Hanson the favorite, and then it was Rodriguez the favorite, and then it looks like Hanson's getting some more money coming in. It's a really close fight that I do not want to put any money on, but I will slightly edge Rodriguez to win a volume-based decision on the feet, stuffing the takedowns. If she gets taken down, work her way back up, landing the harder shots, and winning a competitive decision, but really no confidence in this pick whatsoever. Uh, Rodriguez for me by decision. All right, next we have an absolute banger. I think this is probably one of the sleeper fights on the card. Like this fight is going to be so much fun, and you know every single Fluffy Hernandez fight uh, is so much fun. And we'll talk about some of them. But we have Anthony Hernandez, who is 28 years old, six foot, with a 75 inch reach, eight and two, and three and two in his last five fights. Uh, Josh Fremd making his debut as well, uh, 28 years old, six foot four, with a 76 and a half inch reach, nine and two and 4-1 and one in his last five fights. So Hernandez is going to be at a pretty big height disadvantage. He's going to be at a 4-inch height disadvantage, and then Frem's also going to have that height advantage and then a 1.5-inch reach advantage as well. So Fremd is going to be the bigger fighter, and Fremd is actually uh, absolutely huge for the middleweight division. Uh, let's take a look at these odds, and we have uh, Hernandez opening up as a minus-150 favorite. He's currently minus-200. And Fremd opening up plus 130, and he is currently plus 170. So, uh, 
Yep, so Fremd is stepping in here on short notice, and I really like what I, I see from the guy. Like, you go back and watch some of his fights, and he's brutally, like, knocked out a couple guys to the point where I thought they weren't getting up. Like, he needs somebody to the head so bad. Um, I don't think I've ever cringed so bad at a knockout. Like, he needed this guy, and the guy, you know, would not get up. You know, the guy was bleeding very, very bad. It was just a very ugly scene. And then he knocked some other guy out, and uh, he landed face down. The guy just wouldn't get up for, like, a couple minutes. Like, this guy, Frem, like, has a ton of power in his hands. Um, he's very, very dangerous. Uh, Anthony Hernandez, this guy's dangerous in his own right. He has 10 fights, and he has five fights, including his contender series fight against Jordan Wright, and all five of those fights have finished inside the distance. He had that knockout win against Jordan Wright in the first round. It did get overturned because of he popped for marijuana, uh, but after that, he got submitted by Marcus Perez in his debut. He uh, submitted Jung Young Park. He got knocked out by Kevin Holland in the first round, and then he submitted Rodolfo Vieira. So, you know, Anthony Fluffy Hernandez fights, they tend to finish. They tend to be very fun. They tend to be wars. And that's why I think this fight's going to be so much fun. Uh, Josh Fremd, he does have a wrestling background, but I do not see him using that here. And honestly, not super impressed with his MMA wrestling. And if he is going to wrestle here, I just don't think he's going to have success, especially coming in on short notice. Is he going to be able to push a wrestling heavy pace for 15 minutes? I lean towards no. Um, and then on top of that, Anthony Hernandez's submission game is obviously very good. Submitting Rodolfo Vieira, you know, tired or not, is is not an easy thing to do whatsoever. And he does have very good submissions as well. So I do think the better grappler is Hernandez. And then on the feet, I think it's going to be very competitive, at least early. It's just Hernandez, very tough, very durable, at least in terms of, you know, getting hit in the head. But his body is very soft. He has been hurt to the body two or three times in the UFC now. So maybe Frem attacks the body, but... I kind of see it playing out like this. I think Frem's going to come in. I think he's going to land some big shots early. You know, maybe hurt Hernandez here or there. But I think Hernandez is going to kind of take over as the fight goes on. I think he's going to push a pace that Frem's not going to be able to keep up. And I think Hernandez finishes Frem in the, the late first, second round. You know, Frem coming in here on short notice. You know, Hernandez is not really a guy you want to come in on short notice. He's going to push a pace. He has cardio to do it. He's tough. Um, and I think he eventually finishes Fremd in that second round. But yeah, Fremd's really good. I like this guy. Uh, but this is kind of a tough matchup to come in on short notice. Give me uh, Anthony Hernandez, second round submission. I think he finishes Josh Fremd after weathering the early storm. All right. Uh, so this is a fight. We have Al uh, Alexi Olenek going against Jared Vandera. This was supposed to be Alexi Olenek uh, going against Alir Latifi a couple weeks ago. Latifi pulled out on fight day, I think like one hour before the fight was car was supposed to start. And then um, they re rebooked it to this card, and then Latifi pulled out again in steps, uh, Jared Vandera. So we have Alexi Olenek, 44 years old, 6'2", with an 80-inch reach, 59, 16, and 1. And 2 and 3 in his last five fights, Jared Vandera, 29 years old, 6'4", with an 80-inch reach, 12 and 7, and 2 and 3 in his last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds. And it is a straight pick -em. We have minus 110 each way. It looks like Olenek opened up minus 135, currently minus 110. And then Vandera opened up plus 115. He is currently minus 110. So, uh, so yeah, Alexi Olenek, 44 years old. When does he turn 45? He turns 45 in, what, maybe June? Yeah, this guy, I, I think he's the oldest f fighter on the roster. I can't think of an older fighter. Uh, he's older than Arlovsky. I know Renault retired. Um, yeah, I think he's the oldest fighter on the roster, with, uh, older than uh, Guido Canetti as well, and he's, he's still going. This guy has a ton of fights on his record. This guy's 59 wins. I mean, this guy has been fighting uh, since before I was born. Um, it's just crazy that he's still going. Uh, Jared Vandera stepping in on short notice here. I'm not overly impressed with Vandera. On paper, his takedown defense is 20%, uh, which is not good. This guy has you know virtually no takedown defense which is not a really a good thing to have against Alexi Olenek. And on top of that, Vandera's striking defense has been uh, terrible thus far, sitting at 43%. So I think Olenek's going to have like a serious path to victory here, and that path to victory is getting this fight down to the mat. You know, looking through the numbers in the career of Olenek, I was actually surprised how good on paper his takedown accuracy is. Um, it's sitting at 46%, so he's landing about half the takedowns he's attempting. And I think he can absolutely take down Jared Vandera here, who not only has horrendous takedown defense, but is coming in on short notice. Like, even on the feet, you have to favor Vandera, but 
Bandera is so hittable. This guy has no strike in defense. He eats punches with his face. I know Olenek's not the best striker in the world at all by any means, but my goodness, you know, he, I, bet, I bet he can hit Vandera quite a bit here. But I think the path to victory is going to be taking down Vandera, whether it's him closing the distance, taking him down, or even pulling guard. I know Vandera on paper is supposedly a black belt, but, I, you know, watching his fights, I just can't tell. I mean, he's been submitted twice. Um, he's been submitted twice, I think, in the last past five years. So these are recent submissions somewhat. Um, he's gotten dominated on the ground in multiple fights. Romanov, no shame in that. Uh, you know, Spivak, no shame in that. But still, um, he can be taken down. He can be dominated. I don't like a submission defense. I think Olenek takes him down in the first round and submits him shortly after. Uh, this is an ugly fight. It's a weird fight. But I think this is a seriously winnable fight for 44-year-old, almost 45-year-old, Alexi Olenek going for a 60th win in his entire career. I think he gets it here against Jared Vandera, who I don't really think is UFC caliber. Uh, give me Alexi Olenek to win. Give me Alexi Olenek to win by first round submission. All right, next we have Vince Pichel going against Mark Matson. A uh, very good fight here. Vince Pichel, 39 years old, 5 foot 10 with a 72 inch reach, 14 and 2, and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. Mark Matson. 37 years old, 5 foot 8, 72 inch reach, 11 and 0, obviously 5 and 0 in his last 5 fights. We'll take a look at the odds and Vince Pichel opened up as a plus 130 dog. He's currently minus 140. And then Mark Matson opened up as a minus 150 favorite. He's currently plus 120. So, I guess the big talking point um, for this fight and you're going to hear it all week is going to be we have an Olympic wrestler in Mark Matson. One of the best wrestlers in the UFC. This guy's wrestling is like top notch. Uh, Greco Roman style. This guy picks you up, he slams you, and um, he's very, very strong. And uh, this guy's wrestling is no joke. So you have an Olympic wrestler, Mark Math, and that's his nickname, the Olympian, going against a guy in Vince Pichel, who literally has the, like the worst takedown defense in the lightweight division. Uh, he has a 25% takedown defense. So. Just on paper, right? It looks like it's an easy win for Mark Matson, and it's 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 not so easy. And the reason being is because there's one massive hole in the game of Mark Matson. It's going to be the gas tank, and you know cardio is is very important, especially a guy like Vince Michelle. So yeah, this is a weird fight, a close fight, but this fight's awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Mark Matson, he is three and zero in the UFC. Made his debut against Anilia Bellardo. Belly Wardo took him down, dominated him in a minute. Uh, then he takes down Austin Hubbard eight times, and then he actually looks like somewhat good in that second round, looks good late second round as well, is able to win that second round. The third com round comes around, he kind of falls off a cliff, and then Austin Hubbard's just teeing off on this guy in the third round. Austin Hubbard lands a big knee, a big knee. Uh, Mark Mastin just eats it, and um, you know Mark Mastin's still able to get two takedowns in that third round, but it was a clear third round for Austin Hubbard. And uh, so that was kind of an issue for me was how he looked in the third round. But, you know, I, I think he can win these first two rounds pretty clearly, especially the first round. Um, he did show off like a new wrinkle in his game against Clay Guida in his last fight. I had no clue Mark Mastin striking was anywhere near what he showed off in his last fight against Clay Guida. I know some people crap on Mark Mastin for that performance because he went out there. He's an Olympic wrestler. He got zero takedowns. But I was actually really impressed that he was able to go out there and outstrike Clay Guida um, in all three rounds, uh, 32 to 15 significant strikes in the first round. He outstruck Clay Guida 31 to 26 in the second round and then 35 to 31 uh, in the third round. It was just really impressive to me that, you know, Mark Madsen showed off that new wrestling He's, uh, or new striking. He's training at a very good gym in fight-ready MMA. I'm hoping they can have his cardio on point because if this guy had cardio for 15 minutes, like this would be an easy, easy pick. It's just, you know, what does he look like in that in that late second round? What does he look like in that third round? You know, Vince Pichel, I think he loses the first round pretty cleanly. No no question about that. I think Vince Pichel wins the, wins the third round pretty cleanly. It's just who's going to win the second round. I'm slightly leaning towards Mark Mass, and I think he's going to do enough in that second, but it could be sketchy. It could get sketchy at times, and if you do have a bet on Mats, and it probably does get very scary uh, in that third round. But you take a look at Vince Pichel. He got taken down four times by Austin Hubbard. He got taken down twice by Jim Miller. He got taken down twice by Roosevelt Roberts. He got taken down uh, seven times by Gregor Gillespie. He's been taken down, what is that, 9, 11, 16 times. 16 times in his last 
like four fights. So I mean, he's, he's fighting Mark Madsen here. So I mean, I think Madsen should get it done. I'm gonna say Madsen wins the first round. I'm gonna say he slightly edges the second, and I'm gonna say he loses the third more often than not. I don't think he finishes Vince Pichel. Pichel's grappling's very good. He's a very tough guy as well. I think Mark Madsen wins a uh, a very close, a very competitive decision. Um, it's going to come down in the second round. So give me Mark Mattis, Matson to win this one. I think it's probably going to be a split as well, but uh, I'll take Matson to get the job done. All right, next we have Mickey Gall going against Mike Malott, um, another guy making his UFC debut, and I'm definitely looking forward to it. We have Mike Malott, who is 30 years old, six foot one, with a 73 inch reach, seven and one and three, or seven and one and one and three, one and one in his last five fights. Mickey Gall, 30 years old, six foot two, with a 74 inch reach, seven and four. And two and three in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds. And Mike Malott opened up minus 140. He's currently minus 190. Uh, Mickey Gall opened up plus 120. He's currently plus 165. So I guess the big thing with Mike Malott is going to be the inactivity. Because you, know, you go and watch this guy, right? Like this guy has three wins in the last, I want to say, four years, five years. And those three wins totaled for like two minutes and like 30 seconds. Uh, this guy has not fought a lot. Um, I think he started his career like in 20, 2010, like something like that. So he's been fighting for a long time, and he only has like nine fights to show for it. So the inactivity is not a good look, but he's training at Team Alpha Male. Um, he's a coach there at Team Alpha Male as well, and I like what I see from the guy You know when he's fighting. I mean, he went out there, and he did um, knock out, or yeah, he submitted Solomon Renfro. He, he knocked him down and then submitted him shortly after. Solomon Renfro did... Um, fight on the contender series had a very close fight on the contender series there so that was a good win there but uh yeah I mean I like what I see from a lot in terms of the striking I think his striking solid I think he has power and then he has a black belt in BJJ his grappling is very good uh, I guess the one thing I don't like about Malad is going to be the striking defense he does look hittable and then he does look really chinny as well has been knocked out by Hakeem Dewadu um, and then he has been hurt in some other fights as well so I think the chin's a concern but you know is he really going to have to worry about the hair against Mickey Gall Maybe, uh, you know, Gall has shown some improved striking. It did look pretty solid against Jordan Williams where he knocked him down twice and then eventually submitted him. But I guess the thing with Gall is, you know, the cardio is not great. He has about one round of gas, and then he definitely, you know, kind of falls off a cliff. But he's very dangerous in his own right, Gall. Both these guys are black belts in BJJ. Um, this is actually surprisingly, like, a, a tough fight to call because I really like what I see from a lot. I've seen, like, improvements with him, you know, throughout his career. In the, in the very, you know, few fights you can watch of this guy, I think there's like five fights available, but, you know, each and every time he looks more and more dangerous, he looks more comfortable on the feet in each and every fight for as long as they last. Uh, when these guys finish the fights, they, they finish them in the first round, so I think this fight probably does finish early. I think both guys have power. I think both guys have submission ability, um, but I'm kind of slightly leaning towards the Mike Malott side. I think he has uh, the better cardio here. Um, I think he has more tools on the feet, especially. And then I really like what I see in terms of, you know, how dangerous he is, the grappling game of Mike Malott. Um, but, yeah, Mickey Gall, I, I think he's somewhat live in this fight. I mean, he has a lot of power. He showed it off in the Williams fight, cracking him a couple times. Maybe he can hurt Malott. Um, Malott's not fought that much in the last, like, five, six years. It's not the best look in the world. So I'll take Malott to win. Um, kind of a sketchy fight, but I think it should be an absolute banger. I'll take Mike Malott to win. I'll take him to win by... Give me like a first round TKO, something like that. I think a first round finish for Mike Malott. All right, moving on, we have Aspen Ladd going against uh, Raquel Pennington. We have Pennington, who is 33 years old, five foot seven with a 67 and a half inch reach, 13 and eight, and four and one in her last five fights. Aspen Ladd, 27 years old, five foot six with a 66 inch reach, uh, nine and two, and three and two in her last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds and Pennington. Open up minus 145. She's currently minus 187. Lad open up plus 125. She is currently plus 162. So um, Aspen Lad came off a, a pretty big layoff. I want to say it was like a two-year layoff. She had, uh, I think, like surgery or something, and then she had those weight-cutting issues as well. Then she finally fought up a weight class at 145 against Norma Dumont. Um, I believe she was the favorite in that fight. I had a bet on Dumont. And that was probably the worst fight of the year. I, I can't think of a of a worse fight off the top of my head, but that was terrible. I mean, Aspen Ladd, she's young. Uh, how old is she? She is uh, 27 years old. So she's young. She had two years off. I was 
probably expecting improvements, but that was like the worst Aspen lad we've ever seen. She went in to the Dumont fight. She looked like horrible. I mean, in the first round, she didn't even throw anything. She was doing this weird stance where she was just bobbing her head and, and not throwing anything for the entire round. And she landed three strikes. She landed three strikes and there was no takedown attempts in that first round. There was no clinching. It was all at distance, and she landed three strikes. Three strikes. It was a, a bad look. And then in the second round, she landed four strikes. Four strikes. Uh, third round, she starts to you know get going a little bit. Coaches get on her a bit. She lands nine, twelve, and five to end the end the fight. But still, it was, it was a horrendous performance. Aspen Ladd does not go for many takedowns until uh, like the third round. She finally starts going for takedowns, and then in the fifth round. Uh, she was finally able to get down Norma Dumont, but it was you know far too late by then. Just a uh, really poor performance. So on, on the feet, it's going to be Pennington for me all day. Um, and then is Aspen Ladd going to be able to take down Pennington is the big question. Aspen Ladd's ground game is very good. Her top control is very good. Her ground to pound especially is very good. Um, but can she get down Raquel Pennington? And I'm kind of leaning towards no. Uh, Pennington, she's very strong. She's very physical. Solid takedown defense. Um, I think she can kind of bully Aspen Ladd a little bit, keep it on the feet, and then just you know outstrike Aspen Ladd pretty cleanly. Honestly, um, Aspen Ladd's path to victory is going to be able to get this, going to be getting this fight down to the mat, and I just don't think she's going to have that much success in doing so. So I like Pennington here. And another thing, you take a look at you know Pennington and who she's losing to. Right, she's losing to Holly Holm twice. Uh, she's losing to Amanda Nunez, GDR, and Jessica Andrade. She's losing to some of the best fighters in the entire division, right? So I don't think Aspen Ladd is anywhere near the caliber of any of those fighters, really. Um, I think all those fighters completely smash Aspen Ladd probably in a round, and GDR has already done that. Um, but um, yeah, you got to go Pennington here. I mean, Aspen Ladd, I think she'll, you got to look better than how she did in her last fight. And that I guess that was up a weight class, but you know, she's somebody that has struggled with the weight cuts at 135. And um, she's looked horrendous um, in the GDR fight. She looked really bad. And there was also another fight where she missed weight. I think it was the Chiazon fight. She looked bad as well. So I kind of want to see how she looks here, um, cutting down weight. I want to see her on the scales, but um, I got to go Pennington here. I think it's a pretty good spot for her. Um, I honestly don't love the line, but you know, last week she was like minus 145. If you got in early, I think that's a great look, but, um, I think it's gonna be a pass for me, but I, th I think Rocky makes this one look pretty easy. Honestly, like Aspen lad, I, I, she's going to have to take down Rocky. I just think it's gonna be easier said than done. So give me Rocky, um, Rocky Pennington to win and give me her to win by decision. All right, next we have, uh, Dracina Rosenstruck going against, uh, Marcin Tibera heavyweight fight here. We have Jarzina Rosenstruck, who is 34 years old, six foot two, with a 78 inch reach, 12 and three, two and three in his last five fights. We have Tybura, who is 36 years old, six foot three, with a 78 inch reach, 22 and seven, and four and one in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds. And Rosenstruck, he opened up minus 140. He is currently minus 148. And then Tybura opened up plus 120. He is currently plus 128. See, so this is a, we got a grappler versus striker here. I mean, Tibera does have some striking, but he's not going to want to strike with Rosenstruck. And I went back through the career of Rosenstruck and watched some of his earlier fights in the UFC. And, you know, this guy has a ton of power. I remember he made his uh, UFC debut against Junior Albini. I didn't know much about Rosenstruck. And, you know, Albini was able to take down Rosenstruck twice. Albini was able to get into mount. I thought Albini was about to submit Rosenstruck. And, you know, throughout his uh, UFC career, I kind of went back to the fight. I'm like, oh, this guy's take down. is not great. Um, his ground game is not great. But you see throughout the years, like, he's working with good people. He's had a good gym. And he's really, you know, improved that takedown defense. Like, if, if Junior Albini and Rosenstruck ran that back, Albini would be getting no takedowns. Uh, Rosenstruck would probably knock him out in 30 seconds. But um, it's just nice to see Rosenstruck throughout his career just improve that part of his game because he, he he really has. I know he got taken down three times in his last fight against Curtis Blades, um, but that's that's Curtis Blades. There's absolutely no shame in that. Uh, Curtis Blades did go three for six on takedowns, and you know Rosenstruck did have some success on the feet, but Blades you know was smart and took him down um, against Cyril Gaon, who's a, a very good fighter. Uh, Cyril Gaon went two for 14, 14 percent in terms of the takedown defense or takedown accuracy. Uh, so Rosenstruck's takedown defense looked good there. Um, against Overeem, Overeem was able to get him down twice, but Overeem was was two for ten. 
So Rosenstruck's takedown defense has actually been really impressive to me. Um, and I don't think that Marcin Tybura has the best wrestling in the world. Marcin Tybura, on paper, has a 32% takedown accuracy. But we take a look at his last fight with Volkov. 16 takedown attempts. 16, and he got zero. He got zero of them. So if Marcin Tybura cannot get down you know, Rosenstruck, it's going to be a very tough night. He probably gets knocked out. Uh, Marcin Tybura did take down Walt Harris, who Walt Harris was gassed after that first um, burst he had where Walt Harris hurt him a couple times, almost knocked him out. Walt Harris slowed down. Tabura got him down. Tabura finished him. He took down a, a very tired Greg Hardy and finished him. Um, he took down, you know, Ben Rothwell. He took down Maxim Grishin, a light heavyweight. Um, so he is, you know, getting takedowns, but against like, you know, Stefan Struve, you know, guys like that, is he going to be able to take down a big and strong guy like Jarzina Rosenstruck? And I'm kind of leaning towards no. Um, if he does, Get down Rosenstruck. Um, I don't know. I, I think Rosenstruck is not a fish out of water on the mat like I kind of expected earlier. I think he has improved quite a bit in terms of his ground game, in terms of working his way back up, all that good stuff. I don't think it's like one takedown and it's over type situation, but I will say Tybura has very good ground and pound. Um, this guy is position over submission. Um, he's very good at taking the back as well. He took the back of Walt Harris, kind of flattened him out and pound him out. Uh, so I do like the ground game of Tybura. He is a black belt in BJJ. So if Tybura does get down Rosenstruck, he could potentially finish him. But I'm kind of more so on the side of Rosenstruck stuffs these takedowns. Rosenstruck keeps on the feet. And Rosenstruck has a ton of power, a ton of power. And Marcin Tybura has been knocked out um, a ton. And he gets hurt a lot. He got hurt in the Walt Harris fight bad. Got hurt in the Greg Hardy fight very bad. Got knocked out by Augustus Sakai in, in a minute. Got knocked out by Derek Lewis. Um, he's been knocked out quite a bit. I'll get the exact number here. But yeah, uh, Tybura has been knocked out a massive five times in his career. And I think it's six here. I think Rosenstruck knocks out Tybura. I'm going to say in the very first round. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think Rosenstruck knocks him out here. So give me Rosenstruck, first round knockout. I think he gets it done. All right, we have Ian Gary going against Darian Week. Should be a fun fight here. We have Ian Gary, 24 years old, six foot three, with a 74 inch reach, 8 and 0. Obviously, 5-0 in his last five fights. Darian Weeks, uh, 28 years old, 5'11", with a 72-inch reach. He is 5-1 and one, and 4-1 and one in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds, and we see that, um, yeah, Gary opened up as a minus 1, if it will load. There it is, minus 225 favorite, and he is currently minus 360. Uh, Darian Weeks opened up as a plus 190 favorite and he is cur or plus 190 dog and he is currently a plus 295 uh, underdog now. So uh, lots of money coming in on Gary and rightfully so. This guy has a lot of hype on him and I completely get why to an extent. Um, so he's 24 years old and I had a big bet on Ian Gary on his last fight against Jordan Williams. I really liked him in that spot. And I went and I, I taped Gary. I went through his entire career, really. And I was like, okay, this guy has has it all. This guy has striking. This guy has the grappling. This guy has the takedown defense. He has the wrestling. Um, he, has, he has everything. He has the cardio. He can go five rounds. Like, this guy is the complete package. And he's he's going out there, and he's, he's looking like this. He's finishing guys as, like, a 22-year-old kid. Um, I think this guy, you know, it very well could be the future. And then there's the one thing I did not like in the tape prior to the Williams fight was his striking defense. Um, he's hittable. He is very hittable. He does that thing where he backs up uh, with his hands down, his chin up in the air. And that was the one thing that scared me in the Williams fight. I thought if Williams wins, it's going to be a knockout because Gary, you know, needs to sure up that, you know, striking defense. And sure enough, my goodness, Williams was out there in the first round, like, like piecing up Ian Gary, um, Gary's face was busted up. Uh, he hit Gary with a ton of hard shots. And, you know, I, I laid a big bet on Ian Gary at a very, you know, bad, bad price as well. And I was feeling horrible. I was like, oh, no, it's not, oh, this can't be happening. Um, and then luckily, luckily, Gary was able to knock out a very chinny Jordan Williams at the end of the first round. But I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know, he really needs to sure up that striking defense. And I think he will. He's 24 years old. He's at a very good gym in Sanford and May. But that was just not a good look. I mean, I was going back. I was cringing at how bad the striking defense was. Like, you can't do that at this level. You can't back up with your hands down, chin up in the air at this level against these dangerous guys. So I guess that's the one thing that worries me. But, yeah, like I said, everything else is great. I mean, 
cardio, striking, grappling, wrestling, everything checks out. It's just the strike and defense would be the one thing that I don't really like. Um, Darian Weeks made his debut against Brian Barberena. I thought it was a very close fight. Uh, I did have Brian Barberena in that fight, but I, I really thought I could have went either way. And, you know, Weeks did come in on short notice as well. I was actually sh- surprised to see that Weeks' cardio held up that good on short notice. He was actually able to take down Brian Barberena four times, and then he also outlanded Brian Barberena 118 to 108. So he showed volume, he showed takedowns, and that's kind of what he does. I mean, Weeks, he's a very good wrestler, multiple takedowns outside the UFC as well. Um, but on top of that, this guy has a ton of power. This guy can hurt you a 100% finish rate for weeks. So, you know, just a very well-rounded fighter. Um, I, I don't really love the price tag of Gary. I get why he's a favorite, but, you know, Weeks is, is absolutely no bum. I think Weeks is UFC caliber. He has a lot of tools um, and a lot of attributes that I really like. The cardio is there. The toughness there. This guy has a long amateur career. Um, he's never been knocked out or submitted in as an amateur or a pro as one uh, loss inside the distance was a, a, a cut stoppage. Um, so this guy's durable, cardio, striking's there, the volume's there, the power's there, the wrestling's there. Another guy that's very well-rounded, I just think that Gary is the much more skilled fighter. I think he has the much higher ceiling, but the strike and defense is like, ah, oh, you know, you know, Weeks, you know, maybe Weeks, Weeks can land a hard shot here, but I'm going to say, uh, you know, Gary wins this fight. I'm going to say he outstrikes Weeks on the feet. You know, I wouldn't even be shocked if Gary was able to get this fight down to the mat. I think in terms of, like, the grappling, the pure grappling, I think Gary's going to have a massive advantage down there. So, um, and on top of that, I don't see Weeks being able to take down Ian Gary. Ian Gary's takedown defense has most definitely checked out. But I think if Weeks is going to win, it's going to be some type of knockout. So, I'm hoping we see improvements from the strike and defense of Gary. If he can pr- if he can improve that part of his game, I think this guy has, like, some serious upside. But until then, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, a little iffy, but uh, I think he I think he gets past Weeks here. I don't love the line, but I th- I'm going to say Gary wins this fight by a competitive decision. Um, I think Weeks could have some moments of success, maybe laying a takedown here or there. I think he's going to land some big shots, uh, but I think Gary, as a, as uh, the fight goes on, going to land more shots, more volume, and I think Gary's going to have success in terms of the grappling as well. So give me Gary, decision, and uh, yeah, can't wait for that fight. All right, four fights left. We have Mackenzie Dern. Going against Tisha Torres, we have uh, Mackenzie Dern, 29 years old, five foot four, with a 63 inch reach, 11 and two, and four and one in her last five fights. And uh, Tisha Torres, she is tw- 32 years old, five foot one, with a 61 inch reach, 13 and five, and three and two in her last five fights. So Dern um, is a looks like it's a pickup now. Dern is yeah, it's a pickup now. So Dern opened up. A minus 110 pick him. Um, she went immediately to a dog, and then she went to a favorite, and now she's back to a pick of minus 110. Torres opened up minus 110. She's currently minus 110, and that is absolutely perfectly how I, I see the fight. I literally see it as a minus 110 pick him. I think this fight goes one of two ways. Either Mackenzie Dern comes out here, she gets the fight down to the mat, and submits Tisha Torres, or Torres stuffs the takedowns, keeps it on the feet, and outstrikes Mackenzie Dern. Um, I think Dern has made improvements to her striking throughout the years, but it's uh, to me it's not even going to be close on the feet. Torres' striking is very, very good. Tons of volume, speed. She's going to be the much faster fighter. Uh, so I think on the feet it's, it's Torres for me all day. And then also the same can be said for Dern on, on the mat. Dern can submit anybody in the division if she gets it down to the mat. The problem is with Dern, the problem has always been with Dern, you know, can she get it down to the mat? Uh, Mackenzie Dern is a 10% takedown accuracy. Her wrestling is is horrendous. I think she needs to improve it. Um, if she can get fighters down to the mat, I she can think she can have some success. But there's even fights where she's not landing takedowns and she's still getting it down to the mat. Uh, like in the Hannah Cyphers fight, I want to say like Cyphers pulled guard or something weird like that. But Cyphers maybe slipped or something, ended up in the mat, and Dern didn't even need a takedown. Same with the Marcos fight. Like um, Dern slipped in that fight, and then Marcos literally went into her guard, so there's some fights where her opponents are making, like, really questionable mistakes, and that's not something you're going to see from Torres here, um, I like Torres slightly, um, she can be taken down, though, she has a 58% takedown accuracy, she got taken down twice by Angela Hill, she got taken down twice by Brianna Van Buren, taken down by Rodriguez, Zhang Wei Li, and Jessica Andrade, Watterson, Lima, the list goes on and on and on, Beck Rawlings, um, but I don't know. I don't. I don't think Dern has the wrestling to get this down to the mat. And then I think Torres has 
Um, really been focusing on the strength and conditioning. You go look at her Instagram. She looks completely jacked. Um, I think she's going to be strong enough to stuff the takedowns here. If she gets the fight down to the mat, Dern probably can submit her. Um, but I'm going to say she stuffed the takedowns. I, I don't know. I, I don't like the t- the 10% takedown accuracy of Mackenzie Dern. But, I mean, this is a, a close fight. Like, honestly, flip a coin. Who who knows? Is Dern going to be able to get this fight down to the mat? I do know one thing. I don't think Torres is going to, like, pull guard. Or if Dern slips, I don't think Torres is going to fall her to the mat like a Cyphers or like a Marco. So I guess I do like that. But um, one takedown is probably all it needs or all Dern needs for me- many fights. And that could be the case here. But I'll take Torres. Um, zero confidence in it. I'm not going to be betting it outside of, I don't hate the, uh, the fight goes to decision or the over two and a half, but even then you got to worry about the Dern sub. I don't hate the finish, um, only for Mackenzie Dern as well, but, uh, I just don't want anything to do with this fight, to be honest. Uh, I'm going to take Torres to win. I'm going to take Torres to win by decision. Next fight we have, my favorite fight on the card. Uh, we have Kamzat Shemaev going against Gilbert Burns, really looking forward to Kamzat Shemaev taking a, a big leap up in competition here against a very dangerous guy in Gilbert Burns. Uh, we have Chmaev, who is 27 years old, 6'2", with a 75-inch reach, 10-0, uh, and 5-0 and and in his last five fights. Gilbert Burns, 35 years old, 5'10", with a 71-inch reach, 20-4, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds, and Kamzat Chmaev is a massive favorite, which is very funny. It's I mean, it's not funny. It's, it's funny that... He was a bigger favorite against John Phillips. So against John Phillips, uh, Chemayev closed at minus 500. And then we see uh, Chemayev is minus 560. Minus 560 here against Gilbert Burns. Uh, Burns um, is now plus 410. So Chemayev, one of the biggest favorites on the entire card. And I think it's rightfully deserved. There's a lot of hype on this guy, and rightfully so. He's been completely dominant, um, not only inside the UFC, but outside the UFC as well. Um, He made his UFC debut against John Phillips, and... I guess the big the big thing with Chemayev is this guy has absorbed one strike. One strike in four fights, which is just not... I mean, you don't, you don't see that ever. Um, John Phillips landed the only strike. Uh, Chemayev outlanded in 43-1, to, to one, and uh, Chemayev was able to submit John Phillips in that second round. Um, against Reese McKee, McKee landed zero strikes. Chemayev landed 40, and uh, Chemayev got him out of there with some ground and pound. Against Mearshart, Mearshart landed zero. Chemayev landed four, knocked him out in 17 seconds. And then against the Leech, Leech landed zero. Chmaev landed 25. Um, so he's just been so dominant. Like, only one guy's landed a strike. I mean, it's just crazy to even talk about. Um, he lands 8.68 significant strikes per minute. He's literally absorbing 0.08 strikes per 15 minutes. Like, that, it, it's, 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 it's unheard of. It really is. So um, I do think that, hot take, Burns is probably going to land a, a strike or two here. And this is going to be Chemayev's toughest test by a mile. I mean, this is not Reese McKee. This is not John Phillips. But I think stylistically, it's just a very tough matchup for Gilbert Burns. Uh, Burns is a legit black belt in BJJ. This grappling, this guy's grappling is some of the best you'll see um, inside the UFC. The wrestling is, has been solid as well. And then Burns has also been you know, improving his striking. He's able to hurt Kamar Usman very bad a couple times in that first round. Um, but I think the big thing for Burns, especially in this fight, is going to be the chin. I don't think Burns has the best chin whatsoever. He was reacting to shots very poorly in the Kamar Usman fight. Usman was hurting him bad. Usman dropped him like two or three fights or two or three times in that fight. And then he also got knocked out by Dan Hooker in the past as well. I think Chemayev knocks him out here, to be honest. Um, you know, could Chemayev take down Burns? You know, if he wants to, I think he could. Um, but if I'm Chemayev, I'm just I'm going out there. I'm knocking this guy out on the feet. I think Chemayev has a ton of power. I think Burns is very chinny, um, but I, I can see this fight playing out a, a bunch of different ways. I don't think Burns is going to have success in a lot of the ways I do see it playing out, though. I mean, Burns, for him to win, I think he's going to have to potentially knock out Chemayev on the feet. Easier said than done. Um, I don't think he's going to take down Chemayev. I don't think he's going to submit Chemayev from his back. It's just I don't really see a ton of paths to victory for Gilbert Burns outside like of a outside of like a flash KO, something like that. So I get why Chemayev is a, a big favorite. I, I agree. I, I know it's crazy that he's a big favorite over Gilbert Burns, but I just don't really see many paths to victory for Chemayev to win here. So, Or for uh, Burns to win here. So give me Chemayev to win. I'm going to say Chemayev wins by knockout, whether it's a you know club and sub potentially, whether it's you know him knocking down Gilbert Burns, finishing him on the mat with some ground and pound, whether it's just him knocking him out on the feet. Uh, Chemayev has a ton of power. He really does. So 
Give me Chimaev to win. Give me Chimaev to win by first round knockout. I can't wait to see if he tu- if he passes the toughest test of his career. But I think he does, and I think he does it in very dominant fashion. And I think he does it honestly in the first round. Give me Chimaev, first round KO. All right, two fights left. We have two title fights. We have Aljamain Sterling going against Piotr Jan. Looking forward to this one as well. We have Piotr Jan, 29 years old, five foot seven with a 67 inch reach. 16 and 2 and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. Aljamain Sterling, 32 years old, 5 foot 7, with a 71 inch reach, 20 and 3, and 5 and 0 in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds. And yeah, this is interesting as well. Because Peter Piotr Jan, on some books, mostly closes a pick'em, but in some books, Piotr Jan was a, a dog, like a plus one hundred dog, um, against Aldermain Sterling in their first fight. And then now we see that Piotr Jan opening up uh minus three fifty is now minus four fifty. And Sterling opened up plus 285. He's now plus 350. So, yeah, Jan is a huge favorite here. And, you know, how can he not be, right? You, you All you have to do is go back and watch their first fight. And how did it play out on paper? You know, Sterling got the DQ win. But we all saw the fight and we saw that in the first round. It was very competitive. Sterling was outlanding Piotr Jan. Sterling outlanded him 27 to 14. Um, I don't want to look into that first round a ton because Piotr Jan takes a lot of first rounds off, kind of takes his time in that first round, kind of feels out his opponents, especially in a five-round fight. And he kind of lost that first round, you could say. I, I will say it was very close first round because although Piotr Jan got outlanded for most of the fight, he did drop uh, Aljamain Sterling at the end of the first round. So it was a very close first round. I mean, I think it could have went either way. Um, the second round comes around, Piotr Jan is able to take down Sterling, but Sterling does outland him 17-10, to 10, another competitive second round. And then uh, you see as the fight goes on, you just see Piotr Jan taking over. You see that Piotr Jan starts landing takedowns. Piotr Jan went 7-for-7, seven seven, 100% on his takedowns against Sterling, whereas Sterling went 1-for-17, 5%. So um, we just saw the fight was playing out, and then Jan, especially in the fourth round, you know, really started to take over. Then the illegal knee happened, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I think... Kind of the same thing here. I think this fight is going to play out a little bit different, probably a little bit closer as well than the last one. I think Sterling's going to come out here with a better game plan. I mean, he came out there in the on fight, the first one with the, with the with the worst game plan possible. He went out there. It looked like he was trying to finish Jan early. It looked like he was trying to put on like a crazy pace on Piotr Jan uh, from the jump, which it was a pace he could not keep up, obviously, and just did not really make much sense there in terms of the game plan. I feel like we're going to get a more calculated Sterling. Um, and I feel like it could be closer, but I I kind of see the same thing, right? I see Jan starting slow, taking his time, feel out process, uh, and then as the fight goes on, he's going to build into it. He's going to add up the volume. He's going to add up the takedowns, and I just don't think Sterling's going to be able to keep up. So um, I like Jan to win. I like Jan to win later in this fight. I actually think he finishes Sterling in the fourth or fifth round. Um, Piotr Jan is a very dangerous fighter, a very dangerous five-round fighter. The way he builds into fights is a phenomenal thing to watch, and I think he does build into the fight. I think he could even drop the first round, but I think he you know, builds on from there, wins the second, third, fourth, and I think he eventually finishes Sterling at some point later in the fight. Um, yeah, this fight's so good. You know, Lots of hype on this fight, rightfully so. Some bad blood as well, rightfully so. It's a good one. I'm looking forward to it, but I, I like Jan here. This guy's phenomenal. Wrestling, grappling, all on point. Cardio's on point. Um, the pace, everything with Jan's on point. So I like Jan here. I like Jan to finish Sterling. I'm going to say fourth round knockout for uh, Piotr Jan. Cannot wait for that fight. And then finally, we have the main event. Do you want to remind you guys that me and Uncle Wheezy um, went live on the MMA Engine YouTube channel. If you have not yet, check out the MMA Engine YouTube channel. We went on there and did a main event deep dive. We talked through it, all the stats, all the good stuff. Talked about it from a betting standpoint as well. So check that out. But um, yeah, we have Volkanovski here going against Korean Zombie. Main event for UFC 273. Looking forward to this one as well. It was supposed to be Max Holloway 3 or Max Holloway Volkanovski 3, which, you know, honestly, I would like to see that a little bit more, but, you know, we can't complain with a Korean zombie fight. Korean zombie is always in some very good fights. So, uh, Volkanovski, 33 years old, 5'6 with a 71 and a half inch reach, 23 and 1, and 5 and 0 in his last five fights. Korean zombie, 35 years old, 5'7 with a 72 inch reach, 17 and 6, and 3 and 2. In his last five fights, Volkanovski, the biggest favorite on the card, opening at minus 330, currently minus 800. Uh, the Korean Zombie opened up plus 270, and he is currently plus 
500. So big favorite here in Volkanovski, and I cannot say, uh, you know, I disagree. I, I completely agree why. You know, maybe a little bit disrespectful to uh, the Korean Zombie, but it's just, you know, how does the Korean Zombie win this fight? And I'm just not, I'm not too sure. He's going to knock out Volkanovski. I think that would be the path. But we take a look at Korean Zombie. He came back after, I think it was like a year layoff, something like that. Yeah, like a year layoff. Um, he knocked out Frankie Edgar, comes back against Brian Ortega, and yeah, that was like the worst Korean Zombie we've ever seen. I remember I had a bet on the Korean Zombie, and my, my jaw was just dropped the whole time. I'm like, what is going on? I was I was so confident in this guy, and he goes out there and gets 50-45 against Brian Ortega on the feet. Um, it was nuts. I mean, Ortega outlands him in every single round. Ortega drops him twice in the fight. Um, Grand Zombie just did not look all there. And then on top of that, Ortega made massive improvements over the over his long layoff, and he looked the best he ever had. But still, you know, I was not expecting Korean Zombie to get 50-45. I guess there was some narrative there. You know, Korean Zombie was dealing with some stuff outside the UFC, so there, there is that potentially. But, uh, man, he looked he looked awful. He looked washed. And maybe that was why he became a, a dog in his next fight against uh, Dan Ige, believe it or not. And he went out there. He showed that he's not washed. He maybe just had an off night against Ortega. But, um, yeah, Volkanovski, he, he went out there, and he 50-45 Ortega. I think it was 50-45 uh, 49, 46, and then 50, 44 with a 10, 8 in there. And yeah, I was, I was there live for that fight. And I remember I had a Volkanovski by decision ticket. I had Volkanovski closing off like a 10 leg parlay. And I was sweating in the, I think it was like the third or fourth round, um, where, you know, Ortega was very close to getting a, uh, th that, that submission on Volkanovski. It was a couple times and I do not know how, Volkanovski, I got out a couple of those. Um, I thought the fight was over, but you know Volkanovski just showed off his submission defense there. And you know, this guy is the complete package. He has everything. He has striking. Um, he has you know grappling, very good grappling, very good wrestling as well. Great takedown defense. But what I like most about Volkanovski is going to be the volume. Not many people really at all go out there and out volume Max Holloway, but this guy did it twice uh, in his last fight. Um, against Max Holloway, outlanded Holloway 137 to 102. I did have a max bet on Volkanovski in that fight. I'm not sure he won. I personally did score it for Holloway, actually, but you know he still outlanded Holloway 137 to 102. Max Holloway did hurt him a couple times, um, and then in their first fight, he did outland Max Holloway 157 to 134. Again, nobody goes out there really and outlands Max Holloway. You know, nobody. But uh, he did it twice, so it just goes to show you know how good Alexander Volkanovski is. I just don't see the Korean zombie being able, being able to compete in terms of the minute winning, like in, in volume, is he going to, is he going to out volume like, Volkanovski? No. Is he going to take down Volkanovski? Absolutely not. Like how does the Korean zombie win? I think it's going to be some type of knockout, but you know, Volkanovski is, he's very good chin. Volkanovski has only been knocked out once or knocked down once, never been knocked out. I just don't see many paths to victory for zombie here. So, um, I eventually do want to see Max Holloway, um, Alexander Volkanovsky three because I, I do personally you know think it was should be one one so I would I'd like to see the third fight but um I probably would go Volkanovsky in that fight as well but uh yeah he's so good he's so good so I'm, I'm gonna take Volkanovsky to win um I'm gonna take him to win by decision out voluming Korean Zombie every single round I don't think it's gonna be competitive maybe there are some moments for Zombie but I think it's uh 50 45 uh clean clear cut decision. Um, just don't see Korean Zombie posing much problems at all. But, uh, yeah, that's about it, guys. So, 13 fights. Went through it all. Thank you all for hanging out. If you guys can please leave a like on the video. Also, subscribe here to the channel. And be sure to check out DFSbythenumbers.com. Check out the most popular option, that $10 betting tier. With that, you get my stats, uh, my articles, my extra content in terms of the videos, um, all that good stuff. I do have two bets already. I'm going to be um, unloading on some bets, just waiting for them to get props out. They've had a week and a half to do it, so hopefully they get them out sometime today or tomorrow, get some uh, more bets out there. But yeah, looking forward to uh, continuing the year. It's been a good year thus far, um, and hoping uh, it continues that way. So uh, that's been it, guys. Leave a like on your way out. Subscribe to the channel. Check out the live stream Friday, 7 o'clock, Saturday, one hour prior to the prelims. And we'll talk to you very soon. Good luck for UFC 273. Let's keep making some money, guys. See ya.